Okay, so the Von Willebrand, sorry, we had to take a little break. The computer went out. Von Willebrand disease is an hereditary bleeding disorder involving deficiency of the Von Willebrand factor. And this is needed for platelet adhesion. It occurs in both males and females. And the gene for this is located on uh, chromosome 12. Again, with the Von Willebrand disease, they have easy bruising, epistasis. Again, menorrhea is gonna be a big deal with these because these, these are girls are gonna have this too. It's males and females. And they have decreased platelet, uh, decreased platelet clumping together. So some of them don't have the factor eight. That's hema, um, that is um, the other ones, but this one just has where the platelets won't clump together, so it won't clump together to stop the bleeding. Um, so these have a prolonged bleeding time, but they may have a normal PT and PTT um, disease. Whereas hemophilia is going to have a um, factor eight is gonna, they're gonna have a normal um, PT and platelet count, but they're gonna have a prolonged PTT. So the hemophilia has a little bit different. They have a factor eight deficiency and a prolonged PTT, but a regular platelet count. Then the von Willebrand is going to have a regular PTT, but a prolonged bleeding time. Their problem is with the platelets not with the factor eight. Interventions is makes sense, completely sense. Avoiding aspirin and non-steroidals. Manage the bleeding episodes with prompt infusion. Uh, children with von Willebrands have a normal life expectancy if they are once again managed well. Treatment infusion of von Willebrand protein concentrate. They'll also get the DDAVP infusion before surgery. Avoiding, they'll avoid aspirin. We want to manage these bleeding episodes with prompt infusion, and they're going to do well. Um, just a little bit, y'all probably won't see a lot of this. Um, I think I've seen ITP just a couple of times. Idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. It's an acquired hemorrhagic disease characterized by thrombocytopenia and purpura. It has a normal bone marrow and um, with usual increase in large immature platelets. Um, this has the purpura, you know, when you have those big petechiae under the skin. The book talks a lot about it and has a horrible picture for you to look at, but usually this is um, self-limiting. A lot of times it follows upper respiratory infections or some type of other infection, something that causes them to have the um, purpura. Usually it uh, will last sometimes up to six months of age. The diagnostic evaluation, sometimes we don't know exactly what causes it. We do know they have a pretty good outcome. The etiology, we know that causes, it's from the up, we don't know if it's caused by the upper respiratory. We know that usually follows an upper respiratory. It's a generalized vasculitis. It looks, looks horrible. Um, it's an inflammation. Sometimes it hemorrhages in the GI system. It's usually in kids between the ages of four to seven-ish. Um, some people say it's after an upper respiratory. It's been known to be after a strep throat. Um, it can affect any type of small vessel in the body. And again, it just talks about the arthritis because you have the inflammation in the joints. You're gonna have some urticaria, you can have purpura, you can have edema, you can have hematuria, you can have proteinuria. Um, it's red, raised, purple spots. It's according to where this affects as to how bad, as, as to what hurts. So if it's in the abdominal area, obviously you're having low diarrheas and that kind of stuff. If it's in the joints, it'll sometimes do the um, ankles, legs, that kind of stuff. Doesn't that look, it just looks horrible. Self-limiting usually goes away within six months. Okay, um, the big thing I want you to know about um, Blood disorders are gonna be anemia, just how we treat it. Sickle cell is big. Um, I think y'all have had sickle cell. Please watch that video. That video really puts it into good perspective and it just explains it so well to you. Remember sickle cell, number one, number one, one of the number one things I want you to do is hydration, hydration, hydration. Hydration, oxygen, pain. 
um, but hydration will prevent hopefully and will slow down everything. So we've got to get an IV in them. We've got to hydrate. Um, as far as remember with the hemophilia, it's the factor eight. And um, with a Von Willebrand, it's the platelet. Um, pretty much, you know, we're going to treat a lot of the bleeding disorders about the same ice, um, putting, a, you know, putting, um, putting pressure on everything, making, watching the ankles, uh, passive range of motion, that kind of stuff. So um, that pretty much covers that chapter. Now we're moving on to cancer, which is very, very, very sad to me. But I will say a lot of kids do great. Uh, cancer, childhood cancer is the leading cause of death from disease in children younger than 15. Leukemia is the most common pediatric cancer with brain tumors and lymphoma being the next. Um, the good thing is the prognosis has just zoomed now. So it's doing, we're doing so much better. Um, I do not expect you to know any cancer drugs. Um, you just, I won't give it, we're going to go a, a, a slight overview of all the cancers. The cancer drugs are changing so much that one of the articles I was going to post and give you has changed in the last six months because thank goodness we are making rave and great strides for cancer. So that's good. Um, some cancers have a genetic basis, things like Wilms tumor, retinoblastoma, and neuroblastoma tend to have a genetic basis. So getting a genetic history is important. I know that y'all um, in the NICU, you know, you have to do that history. And I keep telling you that history is so important, but I'll go on all the way back, getting a history. Um, if you have a child in the hospital, getting a history, getting a history, getting a good family history, figuring out chromosome abnormalities, Down syndrome have a, um, Down syndrome babies have an increase in leukemia. All I can say is bless those babies' hearts because we know they have a 90% of Down syndrome kids are going to have a cardiac de defect. And now we are saying they're also going to have an increased incidence of having leukemia. Bless. They're the sweetest babies and bless their hearts. They just have lots going on with them. Immunodeficient children are more likely to vary, de develop, to develop various cancers. And why is that? We all know that we have cancer cells in our body, that what we eat, what we do, how we live, will kind of keep those cancer cells quiet, if you will, stagnant, if you will, asleep, if you will. So if we expose them to environmental carcinogens, if we smoke, if we um, do things that are not good for us, we know that it's going to trigger those cancers. So obviously kids that are immunodeficient have an increased incidence of having developed various cancers. And then drug exposures are at risk for cancer too. Uh, common forms of childhood malignancy, leukemia, acute lymphoblastic, um, peak age is usually between two to five years of age. Lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's. Non-Hodgkin's is six to 16 years of age where Hodgkin's is a little bit older. Central nervous system tumors, we'll talk a little bit about, we'll do a little blastomas. Solid tumors, we're gonna hit most all of those, neuroblastomas, Wilms tumors, retinoblastomas, rhabdomyosarcomas, and then osteosarcomas. This is the difference between childhood cancers and adult cancers, and this is kind of just a comparison. Um, uh, childhood cancers are only 2% in the United States, whereas adult cancers are more. Um, childhood cancers involve more of the central nervous system and the bone and the muscle, things that are quiet or things that we can't tell. Whereas the adults are like breast or colon or prostate, you know, kids don't, have, don't really have breast tissue yet and, and kids really haven't had a chance to smoke six packs of cigarettes a week. And kids aren't doing things they shouldn't do for whatever, or don't, prostate cancer doesn't usually happen in kids. So that's the reason that it's normally central nervous system would be things they're either born with or just developed on kind of on their own. So that's why kids can't really prevent cancer. You say, what could have I done? There's not a lot of detention, there's not a lot of prevention. Whereas we know adults have an 80% prevention rate. We know if we do self breast exam, if we do prostate exam, and if we um, don't smoke and don't vape and we eat healthy and we do this, this, and this, we can try to prevent a lot of those things. The other problem with childhood cancers is that early detection is generally accidental. You know, you don't go into a doctor's office expect them to say you have a retinoblastoma. 
it's just detected because you happen to go in that day. Or I'm going to tell you stories about a retinoblastoma when we get to it, but it's generally just an accident. And, um, but for adults, it's a screening test. Maybe it was a colonoscopy, maybe it was a mammogram, maybe it was just going to the doctor, but that screening test usually caught it. So that's why a lot of times with adults, it can, it's staged as a local. So it's a local and, and, you know, maybe they can just, they can get it all. Whereas kids, usually by the time they find it, it's metastatic and it's already um, present in 80% of the body or um, it's, it's spread, I guess you should say, 80% of the times. Childhood cancers are not a, are not a, a th nothing they caused. So we need to make sure kids know it's not, you didn't cause this. You didn't do anything wrong. Somebody will say, was I bad? A lot of times the kids will say, was I bad? I was bad today. You're going to draw my blood. That has nothing to do with that. Um, we're going to do um, diagnostic evaluation. Unfortunately, a lot of the evaluation that we're going to do hurts. The labs hurt, the biopsies hurt, the imaging studies don't really hurt, but they're scary. Um, and then obviously physical exam hopefully won't hurt, but again, they're scared. The kids are scared, but kids usually present with some cardinal signs. The modes of therapy, usually where kids will do more conservative, we'll do as conservative as we possibly can. Chemo radiation, again, a lot of times it spreads, so we're having to do both chemo and radiation. Um, occasionally bone marrow transplants, and we've had great, great, great uh, success with bone marrow transplants. This is just talks about the different bone mineral transplants, finding if you can find a suitable donor. Obviously, it's better if you can find um, a, a relative donor, but uh, what you want to do is finding of a histocompatible donor with the recipient, and it really, um, we've had great success. Stem cells. So we've talked about how important stem cells are, and so we know that every um, umbilical cord has about um, it's between 200 and 300,000 stem cells in it. Whereas our body and our bone marrow and stuff, they're gonna only have like a thousand stem cells. So the umbilical cords are just so rich. I guess I don't understand why we're not taking every umbilical cord out there and just using every stem cell from it. Cause I know when they cut my kids umbilical cord, I, I mean, at the time I didn't know a lot about this, but I wouldn't have cared if they needed it to save some kid. But rich um, umbilical cords are a rich source of um, stem cells and they can be found in high frequency and circulations in all the newborns, so that's a good thing. The benefit of umbilical cord is the blood relative immunodeficiency at birth and it allows for partially matched and unmatched. So it doesn't have to be that child's cord blood that can do them some, some help. So that's what I'm saying, just take, all the, just take all the umbilical cords. Let's just use all the umbilical cords. Um, it helps a lot of times if we can use a patient's own bone marrow and sometimes they will freeze it and then remove the malignant cells and give it back to them. That's been used in a lot of the file, those tumors that are to, um, listed below and sometimes that works. And then sometimes we do the stem cells. When children, um, nursing care for children with cancer, the child and family have to be educated on the disease and the treatment. Um, the treatment's going to change. I don't, it's very rarely that any two kids we treated exactly the same um, because one's a little more this stage and a little less this and a little more this and a little less this. Uh, the dosage and the drugs are changing daily. Like I said, you don't need to worry about that. Um, there's a lot of side effects from all everything that we do. There's a side effect. It seems like there's a complication from every treatment. Um, there's probably not a lot of difference in the child and family coping skills because all of the all of the kids, if they're old enough to comprehend what's going on, um, the kids seem to do much better with it than the parents. The parents start thinking, I can't believe my child's going to die. The kids are thinking, so I'm going to go through the closet at, uh, at CHOA one more time. They have the Athlete Cancer Center and talk about, honey, those places, they are, that is such a fun place. It is a very sad but fun place. They do so much for those kids and those kids actually don't mind going because they have friends there and they have lots of stuff going on. So, so getting them in a, in a supported environment is great. Um, making sure that the quality of life during treatment is maintained. So if they go to school, they need to stay in school, which now, you know, I guess if there's anything good about COVID, at least those cancer kids aren't getting behind. They're not doing, they're not getting any less than anybody else. They can Zoom just like everybody else can Zoom. So, I guess that's kind of maybe one little good thing about it. Um, 
and now you know we have computers and stuff kids can zoom each other and that's kind of nice if they can stay you know stay with their families and uh stay with their friends and stuff this is particularly important when it comes to um, the the adolescents um the child and the family have to adjust to a chronic illness so you have this kid and i will tell you a true story so my son is moving in his sophomore junior year of college with one of his high school friends they're so excited they're going to live in downtown athens oh my goodness we can finally walk to downtown we both turned 21 all is well and they're moving in all this you know nasty equipment in this nasty apartment that the mother didn't agree of but anyway and um the next day the roommate he said he had a little cough and then he had a cough and his um chest was really sore he's kind of achy well they chalked it up to just um you know they've been moving equipment i mean moving furniture and stuff and it just had to be i mean they moved they put 10,000 couches inside and outside this place. So they had, I mean, it's like, oh, it's probably just moving all the stuff around. And um, I, I have no doubt that they probably weren't eating the best. And then, so he continued to get just a little bit sicker and just a little bit sicker. So finally by the fourth or fifth day, he um, was going to Georgia and he said, I'm just gonna go to the health clinic and get um, maybe an X, I mean, get either an X-ray because I think I might've pulled a muscle or just get some antibiotics or something. So I went, they did a chest x-ray, child had leukemia, had to drop out of school, um, had leukemia, ended up having bone marrow transplant. Um, it's definitely doing better now, doing, fine, doing well now. We hope it never, you know, obviously never occurs. But this was just a 20 year old that was just living life. And um, it just happened that quick. So we tried to make sure, you know, you try to make sure that their quality of life is maintained. He obviously had to drop out of school for a semester. He since then has come back and has finished, but um, it just it just is a major stop you in your tracks kind of thing. Obviously the younger ones growth and development is very, very important that we maintain that. We still need to make sure that they are learning to read and write and learn to do all that kind of stuff. Signs and symptoms of, of cancer in children, pain. Um, lots of times kids, you know, when kids, come to me and they are complaining of pain. Um, a lot of times I have the parents are complaining of pain, their ear hurts, they this, and the parents will tell me, but if I can, if I can talk to those kids, I can usually figure out what's going in. If I have a kid that comes in limping, you know, like a two year old limping, two year olds don't limp, two year olds run with gust. So if I have a child that's limping, something's up. If they have a, a fever, the mom says, I can't get the fever to go away. I have given Tylenol. We're on day five, day six. Something's going on. Skin changes. Again, the bruising, anemia, abdominal mass, swollen lymph nodes that do not go away. So I told you that we normally with lymph, size, lymph nodes, we had pea size, marble size, um, golf ball size. But they kind of come and go because the kids are always kind of fighting something off. I'm talking these are swollen lymph nodes that don't go away. So we're gonna, what we're gonna do is manage some of the side effects of the, tri of the cancer treatment center, I mean, cancer treatments, um, and trying to keep these kids um, as normal as possible. We wanna do lots of health promotion. Dental care is gonna be really big because the chemotherapy and the radiation is very hard on their gums of their teeth, and we gotta make sure that they keep good dental care. We want to make sure that they stay up on their vaccines. Unfortunately, a lot of times if these kids have chemotherapy during time when they're getting their vaccines, they may have to be revaccinated after the chemotherapy has stopped. We need to talk to the parents about, um, obviously they're going to feel, we need to communicate with them about their feelings of helplessness and, and uh, depression and stuff, but we'll have some, some parents that are like, I'm going to take my kid to Can Canada because there's a new therapist who says they can cure this. So we have to really make sure that they thought, thought things through um, and that we kind of go through some of the, the, all the treatments. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some specific types of cancer. Again, leukemia um, is, uh, acute le lymphocytic leukemia is the most common form of childhood cancer, three to four cases per 100,000 in Caucasian children, usually younger than the age of 15, more frequently in males than females. The peak onset is two to five years of age, but there is a good survivability of this one. 
Um, leukemia has a broad range of malignant bone diseases, a bone marrow and lymphocytic. The classifications are very hard. You don't need to know the classifications. But you do need to know that there's, it's like, just that there are like ALL, AML, um, the chronic lymphocytic leukemia is usually older adults. Um, the one, the ALL is the one that's most common in young children. And so my story for that one is I had, um, I was working at a private practice in Livonia, Georgia. And I had a mom, mom and dad, both school teachers. All was good, no problem. They were in Panama City. And she called on a Friday afternoon and she said, look, he has been limping for the last couple of days. And she said, he's had this runny nose, the cough and stuff, just, you know, things that kids get, this upper respiratory infection. I've given him a Zyrtec, blah, 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 blah. I thought it was because he had been swimming in the pool a lot. But anyway, he's been limping. And she said, it's getting worse and worse. If we get back from Panama City in time, can you look at him? Okay, I'll look at him. So I'm, um, I'm thinking and I'm talking to the physician I'm working with and we had kind of come up on our own just by all the information that she'd given us that had he failed that kind of stuff on the phone. I kind of thought that he had a septic hit and the physician agreed with me, I think it's probably septic hit. So I called every orthopedic in Athens to see who would take care of a two year old with septic hip. So as they were coming back from Panama City, they could just stop there could not find an orthopedic in Athens that would take care of a septic hip on a two-year-old. They all wanted him to go to CHOA. Okay, well, just come on home. So they came home. She gets in there at five minutes till five. Sure enough, he's puny looking, but he's just ridden eight hours. He's a little pale, but she said she kept him coated down with sunscreen. Got that runny nose, little cough, but he is limping. True, true limping. Um, I could move him around and stuff, but he would say his hip hurt. Hard to tell him a two-year-old whether it's hip or knee, but every time I would, you know, move his hip in certain ways, frog-like position, he said it hurt. So I said to her, look, I am pretty confident that it's a septic hip. Normally, septic hips have to go on antibiotics for at least probably seven days, but, you know, you might can get home after, uh, after a couple. Go on to CHOA. So go on to Scottish Rite. They do really good with their bones. Go home first, get you, change y'all's clothes, pack you a bag, pack him a bag, and go on out there. I'm not even going to draw a CBC because by the time in Livonia that I get it sent to the hospital and get it back to me, you could be halfway to Choa. And then they're just going to draw out again. So I said, just go on out there. She said, okay. She goes home. They change. Dad stays with the sister. All's good. Mom and the, the little boy go out there. Um, and she said, for, went in, had orthopedic coming in. I'd already called them until they were coming. Had orthopedic was coming in, but we're getting lab work first. We get the lab work. And she said, the, the nurse and the um, technician came back in there and said, I am so sorry that we're going to have to stick him again. But his lab work came back all screwed up. Okay, well, it just happens. So held him down, stuck him again. It wasn't long at all that the nurse comes back in. And um, the ER physician was with her. And the ER physician said, I'm not sure what's up, but something's up. We've, count, we've canceled the orthopedic consult and I've got hematology on their way. And this child had ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, 18 months, two years of age, and how he presented was a limp, a limp on one side. Um, I will say since then, he has done very well. He had um, bone marrow transplant and um, did very good, but very, very scary at the time. Okay. Um, children with trisomy 21, like we said, have a great 20 times greater risk of having developing ALL. Um, children more than 50 chromosomes will have an increased incidence of it also. Diagnostic evaluations, obviously it's based on history, physical, and um, checking those, those blood counts. Uh, very, he had a very low blood count. Um, then they'll do an LP, bone marrow aspiration, and decide exactly what type of cancer he had, um, and making sure that it wasn't just some type of, um, you know, anemia. And um, then he started through the whole, the whole um, management. 
Um, what happens in leukemia, they have a decreased red blood cell count, push, they have infections from neutropenia, they do, tend to have a little bit of bleeding tendencies because they have some decrease in platelets. Um, it usually will mark on their um, spleen, liver, and lymph glands. There's usually th three phases of the therapy, the induction, the consolidation, and the maintenance therapy. He is now, gosh, middle school. He's doing fine, he's doing good. He has hopefully gone to, he's in maintenance therapy, but maybe he's even past that now. The lymphomas, we have Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. The Hodgkin's is more prevalent in the 15 to nine year, 15 to 19 year olds, and the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is more prevalent and younger than 14 years old. The Hodgkin's is a neoplastic disease originating from, lymph, from the lymphoid system. It often metastasizes to the spleen, liver, bone marrows. It's very important that we catch this early as possible and that we get accurate staging. How do we get accurate staging? We send them to Aflac, Transfer, Aflac Cancer Center. Um, the first part of the staging can be the kids are asymptomatic, so we don't know to stage them because we don't really know they've got it just yet. And then they'll start having a lot of times um, we see them in the stage B when they're starting to have weight loss or something else is going on with them. This is the areas of uh, where the lymph nodes involvement in the Hodgkin's disease. Obviously, the cervical is very, very big. Axillary, um, the spleen. Diagnostic uh, treatment is they will do a biopsy of the lymph nodes and diagnostic and, and diagnose it and stage it, and then they'll decide on the treatment. Again, you do not need to know about treatment because every treatment is different. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, approximately 800 new cases each year. It's more prevalent in younger children. Usually um, they appear as whether it's um, diffuse rather than just, a, just one nod, it may be one node, it may be a lot of different ones. A lot of times these have the med uh, medial stonal involvement. These are a little bit harder to diagnose. Okay, nervous system tumors, CNS, brain tumors. Brain tumors are neuroblastomas or derived from neural tissue, account for 25% of children, childhood cancers. Tumors are, that are difficult to treat usually have a poor survival rate. Um, most brain tumors are the most common solid tumors in children. They're usually in the inferal of uh, the posterior third of the brain, which is like the cerebellum or the brain stem. Most common clinical manifestation of brain tumor is headache. I want y'all to get that. Does everybody get that? Most common solid tumor in children is brain tumors and headache, 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 headache. Do not overlook a child that comes in with a headache. Sometimes they come in vomiting. Yes, it can be migraines. It can be migraines. It can be other things. Sometimes kids can just have a headache, but these kids that keep having headaches, we don't need to just overlook these. It's the diagnosis is based on clinical presenting sign. Do not get that, let, let that get overlooked. They're gonna come in with a headache. A lot of times we'll give them a neurological evaluation. So then we still have to start, we have to start ruling out, um, are they, like kids who can tell me that when they're at school and they're staring at a screen and they have an aura and they take Motrin and get in a quiet room, well, that's a migraine. These kids are just having clinical, they're having headaches for no reason. It's not, there's not a pattern. There's not anything. It's not related to foods. It's not related to this. I'm gonna go ahead and get an MRI. I'm gonna get a CT. I'm gonna get an MRI. I'm gonna send them to neurology. Let's get a good neuro evaluation of it and let's see what's going on. Therapeutic management depends on the type of tumor. Um, sometimes we can do surgery and get rid of the tumor. Sometimes we do, um, radi um, do radiation first and then surgery. Um, it's according to how quick we catch this cancer to decide what the prognosis is. The next one is neuroblastoma. This one is, is very scary to me because it, neuroblastoma is a cancer that starts in the early forms of the nerve cells in an embryo. That's what neuro means embryo or means nerves. Blastoma refers to a very immature developing cells. So it's a uh, immature developing cells in the nerve system. This type of car, uh, cancer usually occurs most often in infants and young children. 
Um, most of the time the babies have this one, it's already spread because we don't know that the babies feel bad. I mean, how many times do we say to the kids, well, they just, um, you know, they're just fussy babies. They're just this, they're just that. When sometimes it could be something. It depends on the location. If it's in the abdomen, sometimes we can palpate or feel something. Sometimes they start not eating good, but you know, we come up with all the most common things. 70% of the cases are, are diagnosed after it has metastasized, so there's a poor outcome, which is very sad. Prognosis um, survival rate um, or is not good for neuroblastomas. Obviously, the younger age that we can diagnose it, the better prognosis because possibly we can catch it earlier. The problem is that it's just in this embryonic cell maturity and um, it's just hard to catch. Osteosarcoma, all those with your, with your athletes you are gonna start worrying about this every time they can say their leg hurts. Osteosarcoma is the most common type of cancer that develops in the bone. Like osteoblast and normal bone, the, cell, um, the cells in this form, cancer makes the bone matrix. So you normally have the osteoblasts that keep the bones really strong and hard. But then when the osteosarcoma starts coming in there, it's like the cancer cells take the place of the bone matrix. And so they're not as strong. And most of the time we catch these because they'll have a, a break. And it's like a break, you're like, um, I'm sorry, Angie, I'm not talking about him, but if they'll have a hit, and you'll say they're playing football. It didn't look like it was that far hard of a hit or not that bad of a fall of the tree or not that bad. Of, and then it's like, oh my gosh. So that's why it's always good to get them checked out. Most osteosarcomas occur in children and young adults. Teens are most commonly affected by group. But well, osteosarcoma can occur at any age. Um, most common tumors are part of the thigh bone. And you know, if you're going to have a femur fracture, it's going to have to be a pretty big hit so they have a hit with you know a helmet but it didn't look like that bad of a hit and they have a, a femur fracture that's sometimes when you start worrying about it upper part of the shin bone or again part of the um, humerus or something like that but most of the time you know but when you get to x-ray that's when we can pick it up our sir also osteosarcoma and urine sarcoma account for eight percent of all malignant tumors in children in the united states and occurs mainly in males with the highest incidence um, accelerated during the growth rate of the adolescents. So when those bone matrix is supposed to be really growing, so is that cancer. Osteosarcoma is not a common cancer, thank goodness. It's about 800 new cases a year, which is 800 more than we want. About 400 of these, when those kids start that growth spurt. Osteosarcoma occurs in children and young adults between the ages of 10 and 30. Teenagers are most commonly affected in this group, but it can occur in any group, any age. So you can have uh, a kid that, you know, fail and didn't think it was that bad of a fall and, and it can be, you know, a seven or eight year old. The diagnosis of brain, of bone tumors, the first you want to rule out is a trauma or infection, making sure that, you know, that it wasn't some major trauma. Um, then we're obviously going to do some um, x-ray studies, CTs, that kind of stuff. And that's when they'll start seeing everything. They'll usually have a um, elevated alkaline uh, phosphatase level with the bone tumors, and that's because it, the um, the cancer cells and the regular um, uh, bone marrow is trying is fighting each other. Wilms tumor. This is also called nephroblastoma. It's a malignant renal tumor. Tumor and the intra-abdominal tumor of childhood is three times more common in African American children. Peak age of diagnosis is three years of age, more frequent in males than females. About nine out of 10 children in this one are cured. That's a good thing because we can normally take out one kidney and those kids can be fine. I mean, in, in general, how many people don't know, how many people know that they have two kidneys anyway? If you haven't had a, an ultrasound of your kidneys, you really don't know that you have one or two. So maybe associated with other congenital disorders, but they do have a high survival rate, thank goodness. Um, rhabdomyosarcoma, this one tends to be from the um, muscles, and it can be, it's according to where the muscles are, um, a malignant tumor um, undifferentiated in, the, in cells of muscles. So it can be in tendons, it can be in fascia, it can be in connective tissue, it can be in all kinds of different tissue, but sometimes it's, um, and it's in muscles. It can be in the nose, it can be in the sinuses, it can be in the middle ear, it can be in the perineum, it can be everywhere. So these are just anywhere that you really have muscle, muscle tissue, it can be. 
um, is highly malignant and frequently metastasized because it's so hard to find. It goes, it's, it's, you know, hard to find these tumors because there's not a very, it's not always one place. We want to remove this tumor if we can. We do radiation if possible. Um, we do chemotherapy to re, uh, reduce it and then hopefully remove it. Um, the prognosis just varies. It's according to how quick we catch it and, um, and how good the chemotherapy actually affects it. Retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is a cancer that starts in the retina of the eye. It's in the very back part of the eye. It's the most common type of cancer, eye cancer in children. Um, children rarely have any other kind of cancer. It uh, can be congenital, but not always. It can be bilateral, but not always. It's usually unilateral. Retinoblastoma is a rare disease. Only about two to 300 children are diagnosed with retinoblastoma each year in the United States, more common in infants and young children than older children. And the average age of children is age two. So I have a true story for you. So I had a um, student who um, actually had to drop out of school one year because her daughter was having twins. Had twins, she came back, she, excellent, top of the class student. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, she, a little bit older, but she um, had these twins and I felt like we kind of watched them grow up. But so they're about one year of age. And, um, well, maybe, maybe a little younger because she had them when they, so I had her, because she was a dimmer student. So anyway, let's, we'll say somewhere between six months and a year of age. And she, we had just had this lecture and she said, Miss Starrett, she sent me a picture and she said, Miss Starrett, you know that picture of that baby? with that had like the cat eye reflex, like cats have at night, you know, when you shine a light in cat's eyes, they have that cat eye reflex. She said, one of the twins has that. I'm like, oh, I don't know a lot about cancer, but I said, tell you what, take it to, do you have an ophthalmologist you see? She said, yes, and just run it by your ophthalmologist and just see. Ophthalmologist said, just let me see them. Brought them in, that baby had retino uh, retinoblastoma. So um, treatment was based on the stage of the tumor. Thank goodness they caught it kind of early, but had not had that. And you know, sometimes you have that red reflex and so you think it's just the red reflex, but this one had more of the cat eye that it was the white, not the red. And so it was just enough for her to go, do you think that's really anything? And it was. So um, baby had um, cryotherapy and actually has vision in um, the affected eye now. Um, sometimes they have to do different things. Occasionally they do have to take out the eye, but look at the baby with a prosthetic eye. You would never know it. See, just, she's fine. Kids do fine. Kids do well. Prognosis is nearly 90%. Tumors may spontaneously regress. Um, you have to make sure that there's not something else going on. Obviously, anytime these kids have any kind of tumors, the parents in the back of their heads always, is there something else? Is there something we didn't catch? Is there a secondary tumor somewhere else? Testicular tumors is not as common, but appearing in adolescents are generally malignant. So we want to take, so um, when kids come in for a sports, in, a sports injury, but even a sports um, physical, it's a good time for me to start talking to them about doing testicular exams. And I tell them that it's not me doing a testicular exam one time every year that's going to catch it. It's you doing a testicular exam every time you get in the shower just to make sure that you don't feel anything unusual, just to show that you don't feel any type of extra growth or um, lump or anything like that. Treatment is orchectomy, or which means they take out one of the testicles. Um, they can still have kids, you know, it's just with one, but it's very important that we teach these kids and the perfect time, like I said, to, to teach these kids to do testicular exam is just in the shower. I mean, you know, just, just do it. Um, the childhood cancer survival, it's a long-term sequelae of the treatments. I, I thank the good Lord every day that I have not had to deal with childhood cancer in my own personal family. I can't imagine the psychological, the cognitive, the emotional, the physical, the financial, the, the, the whole effects that it would have on a family. Um, their effects from radiation, their effects from chemotherapy, their effects, the, um, the child that I was telling you about or the boy that I was telling you about that 
of was my son's friend. He's had to have bilateral hip replacements. He's had, already had to have both of his hips replaced at 27 now because the chemo and radiation was so tough on his, um, on his bones. So, you know, you got a lot, there's a lot that these kids have to eventually deal with. I mean, you know that if you have hip replacement at 27, you're probably going to have to have it again at what, 47 or 57, and then maybe again at 77. And it's just a lot, a lot for kids to deal with. Um, as a parent, I, I'm sure you're just happy that they're alive. Um, it probably would make us all a little more appreciative of what we've got. Um, I, I hope that just um, reading through this childhood cancer survivor thing or reading through childhood cancers will just make you um, appreciative of every kid that you see that doesn't have it. And if you have kids of your own, really makes you appreciative. For those of you fixing to have nieces and have nieces and nephews, it will make you appreciative. It also makes you a little paranoid because um, my kids couldn't get a bruise without me going, oh, what's going on? Sometimes we know too much. But sometimes us knowing too much can save their lives because we can get on it quickly. Okay, um, I am sorry that y'all had to deal with a Zoom. I'm gonna to try to get it posted up as soon as possible. Um, as far as cancer, a little recognition or a little going over that. Um, headaches with um, the brain tumors. I'm thinking of stuff. Obviously, they're going to be uh, immunocompromised, almost all of them. Read all of the nursing alerts in there. I feel like I'm missing something. Make sure you read all of the nursing alerts. Read the, about those neuroblastomas. Read the little the part in that. The stuff of the cancer that we skipped as far as radiation, chemotherapy and stuff, do not worry about that. I am not testing you on radiation. I'm not really testing you on chemotherapy. I'm not testing you on any cancer drugs. Um, the only thing that you would need to know as far as blood drugs would be like the DDAVP. And that's just, that was just that, between that and iron, I think that's all that's on the um, blood one. So um, if you have any questions, y'all feel free to send me a text message. Um, send me an email that way i can send it back out to everybody um all right y'all have a good weekend be safe take care i will see y'all monday in clinical because i've had chicken noodle soup and it's staying where it was so talk to you later bye bye